What's up, everybody? Late. This has been a crazy day, but I, you know, I wasn't gonna leave you hanging. Uh, um, I was gonna definitely get on and teach Bible study tonight. Hello. Again, this is Zandra Wilson. I'm your Bible study for marriage and a single lady. This is workshop series number eleven, class number seven. The topic is the two shall become one. So I'm gonna just dive right into it. Just you know, I'll be missing you guys. So again, leave me comments, um, suggestions, um, anything, and you know that you think that would help us to help you. I'm one of the Bible study teachers here, along with Minister Joanne Sims. So let's just open up with a word of prayer. So, Father God, I thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to be able to teach, Father God, what you've called me to teach, Father. I ask that you remove Zandra and just allow the Holy Spirit, Father, to rest, rule, and abide within this message tonight. Remove me, God, and let the Spirit speak to your children, Father God. I thank you for this privilege. I count it as an honor to be able to teach anything, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you so much. I ask God for prayer for those who will join us tonight during this class, Father God, and also for those, Father God, who will um, watch later on YouTube and also who will catch us a little bit later, Father. I thank you, God, for the support of your people. I hope, God, that this message touches their hearts, Father, that they not only are hearers of the word, but they're doers. I lift all of these things up to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, everybody. So again, as you know, I've been teaching from Restoration. This is my book that's on Amazon. It's a journey of faith and obtaining and restoring godly relationships. So we're just going to go through the entire year. Um, you can get a copy for free on Amazon Prime, or you can copy your copy from me in the streets, or you can get it from my website or on Amazon. It's broken down into lessons. You have uh, the assignment for the week and then you journal for the rest of the week. So I'm excited. So tonight's lesson is the two shall become one. It's coming from Matthew chapter 19, verses four through six through the, from the NIV version. So we're just gonna jump right into it. Let me pull up my notes. And so we can just kinda do this, right? Just do this thing. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is pretty deep. So bottom line, this is Jesus talking here. And he's just telling them, like, haven't you read? Moses gave the law, so this is what it was. It's bottom line, he said, what God has put together, let no man tear it apart. It's not like, um, we know these things, strife, animosity, things of that nature. But tonight, we're going to talk about the two shall become one. What does that mean? Now, I have to admit, being a divorcee myself, I did not understand what it means or what it meant when he said the two shall become one. I felt like I need to still have my own identity. Do I need to really change my name, my last name from Wilson? You know, I just felt like I needed to have this separation. And so I didn't really understand what it meant until I got a divorce and really started understanding scripture and the things of God. Jesus was quoting from the creation account recorded in the second chapter of Genesis. Jesus pointed to this passage of scripture because he knew it to be true history. John 17, 17. So let's turn to John 17, 17. Hopefully you have your Bibles and you can follow along with me. My Bible is falling apart. It's falling apart. Okay. So John 17, 17. And you definitely need my glasses. Glasses with me. Of course, of course, this is Jesus talking. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. The original design of marriage was designed to form a permanent bond of union between man and woman that they might be mutually helpful to each other. Living together in love and confidence, they could enjoy great happiness. 
God created woman as a mate for man by using the man's rib as a base, thereby making woman man's closest fleshly relative on earth, his own flesh. Let's go to Genesis 2.21. Genesis 2.21 says, let's see, Genesis 2.21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. So he made us out of man. He took a rib and he made woman. So when marriage or relational problems arise, don't look for an easy way out, but earnestly strive to display godly qualities to make your family life happy. Such efforts will bring lasting happiness. That's Ephesians 5.33. What does it mean then that a man and a woman become one flesh in marriage? So let me read Ephesians 5.33. Okay, y'all. I'm telling you, I, I'm at this age now where I need glasses. Okay, Ephesians 5.33. It says, um, however, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Ah. <sighs> You heard that? Okay. The most obvious way that they come together is through sex, right? This is born out of 1 Corinthians 6.16 when Paul says, even a man with a prostitute becomes one flesh with her. The act of sex is a manifestation of one flesh physically and a metaphor for the other ways a married couple joins together. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6.16. I don't want to just throw this stuff out at you. You know, guys, I love to, anything that I'm teaching, I like to pull the scripture up so you can read the scripture along with me. So prayerfully, you have your Bibles. So 1 Corinthians 6.16, what does it say? I need class. Okay. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. Now you would think that this will stop a lot of people from just sleeping around or sleeping with a prostitute. Nope. There you have it right there in, in black and white or red or whatever you have in your Bible. It's, it's flat out. It tells you that once you're sleeping with people, you become one. The two shall become one. Now that's even if it's not your partner, right? If it's someone you're just sleeping with, you're becoming one with that person. So you, that's why, you know, obviously why we should be virgins when we get married. So you're just one with your husband or wife. Much of the physical part of life involves maintenance, feeding, housing, repairing. A man and woman become one flesh in marriage when they share these things as a unit. A man is called to leave his parents to step out of their home and provision, right? And become one flesh with his wife. As husband and wife work together in the stuff of life, they become united and may even start to look like each other. So we've heard that because with my parents, they were together for so long. They started writing alike. They didn't look alike, but they had a lot of very, um, a lot of similarities. So when you're with someone for a very long period of time, you really just start you know, you, you you just become one with that person and everything. You start thinking alike sometimes. You guys get, get what I'm saying. So, and some people, they say even starts to look alike. The flesh is also how we actively respond to what Jesus has done for us. God has prepared good works ahead of time for us to accomplish. Ephesians 2.10, let's go there. Ephesians 2.10, let's go. So guys, I know you have your Bibles and I know you're turning to your Bible. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're prepared to do good works, right? So you wanna be united to 
the one you're supposed to be united to, okay? As one flesh, a married couple coordinates their efforts, right, to ensure they get the work done, both as individuals and as a team. As any couple surrounded by kids, church, work, and friends knows, husbands and wives cannot fulfill their God-given duties unless they work together. Beyond practical and spiritual matters, we need to realize that our flesh belongs to our spouse. Now, a lot of us don't like this. I'm going to read the scripture, then we can talk about this. 1 Corinthians 7, 4. A lot of us don't really like the fact that, you know, we, we it's my body. And we want to do with our bodies as we please to do with our bodies. Um, yeah. 1 Corinthians 7, 4, it says, I have great confidence, great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. I cannot read, guys. Is this 1 Corinthians? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading 2 Corinthians. Oh, 1 Corinthians 7, 4. I was reading 2 Corinthians 7, 4. I'm like, that doesn't sound right. 1 Corinthians 7, 4 says, Here it is, Oops. Um, three, four. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. So the bottom line, we don't belong to each other. We don't belong to each other. He, I don't own my body and he doesn't own his body. And a lot of times we don't like that. So ladies, when it comes to intimacy, when it comes to just things that we wanna do with our bodies, even some people will argue, um, abortions and and um, things of that nature. I personally just think that it, it's it's wrong. Um, the argument is that's her body; she can do what she wants to with her body. But when you're married, it's not your body. It's wrong. I think it's wrong. Even if you're not married, that's my own personal opinion. But if you're married, you don't own yourself. It's your you 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 guys are one. The two shall become one. So you're as one, right? So if we go into the marriage realizing that, and that's why it's so important to be united to the right person because you want someone that's sensitive to your needs, ladies, if you're tired or if he's tired and you know, you've been working all day and you're cooking and you're running out of kids and then he wants A, B, C, F, and G. You may not be up to doing A, B, C, F, and G. So you want to make sure that you're united, that you are on that one page, right? You want to make sure that you basically you're united as one flesh that you you don't belong to each other so that's why you have to be uh -huh. you, you know sensitive to each other's needs uh -huh. is what i'm trying to say <sighs> the way that we treat our body needs to reflect the respect we have for our spouse right so you can't just do any and everything to your body tattoo your body up let your body go right a lot of us just eat a whole lot and we gain a whole lot of weight or we don't eat and we get anorexic you know, works both, both ways. We have to take into account that we, our body is not our own. So we want to take care of it to the best of our ability. As trivial as it may sound, things like fitness, hairstyles, and tattoos should always be considered when your spouse is in mind. And I understand that because a lot of times, ladies, or fellas, when you're out with your boys, you're out with your girls, and you feel like getting a tattoo, you're not even thinking about, let me ask my wife to see if this will be okay. A lot of us just don't like that at all. We don't want to ask nobody for permission for anything. This is my body. This is my money. I work for this. I don't have to ask you for this. I don't need to, you know, and we kind of lose the, the, the whole, um, the whole, what God is saying is that we are one. It's not just about you anymore, Zandra. So if you choose to get a tattoo, it affects your spouse, even changing your hairstyle. Now that's kind of cutting it for me because I love my short pixie cut. But it was brought to me like, what if your husband wants you to grow your hair out? That might be a problem. <laughs> I don't want to grow my hair out, right? But, you know, that's why you, you talk about as much stuff as you can. Um, but you guys get what I'm saying. Some people are like, girl, just do it for you. And it's like, I'm doing it for him. Then I have to look in the mirror and I'm not pleased with what I see, right? So it's it's like a slippery slope. And prayerfully, you have an understanding partner. But that was something, that was an analogy that was brought to me. Um, I understand fitness. I understand tattoos. Um, you should always be considered when you're, you know, with your spouse in mind. Falling into poor health is so big because your spouse has to take care of you. If you're not, if you're not in good health, 
you know, through negligence directly affects the lifestyle of your spouse. So even endurance, if you guys were active and you were going out hiking and you were just on the run, now you just allow yourself to just get into ill health. Um, whatever that means, whether it's overweight, underweight, not eating healthy, because you can still be a nice weight, but just not healthy on the inside. So bottom line, your outside doesn't always necessarily reflect your inside, especially when you're younger. When you start getting older, it starts to tell on you. But you have to take those things into consideration because maybe your spouse loves intimacy, right? Loves sex. And now you've gotten overweight, so you can't hang anymore. And that's on either end. And with women, we're self-conscious about our bodies if we've gained a lot of weight or whatever. So now it's affecting your spouse. So we just have to kind of keep all of those things into uh, consideration. And a lot of times we don't because we... We're looking at it like this is my body and this is mine, this is mine, this is, this is mine. Once you're married, you're not, it's yours one. Asking for input regarding clothes and hair shows that you care, and hair shows that you care how your spouse sees you. This also applies to physical behavior. It is disrespectful to flirt, dress revealingly, or in any other way, use your body and actions to infer um, to infer, I'm sorry, that you are not one flesh with your spouse. So you ladies, a lot of people, it's just innocent flirting or it's just, innocent. no, it's not. You have to take your spouse into consideration when you're doing these things. The world is going to try to pull all of this apart, right? It's going to say that your body is your own, to use it and treat it as you see fit. It's going to insist you have to, to look a certain way or do certain things with your body in order to fit in. It will also lure you away from the united home life in the name of freedom. This is big. Independence and what you deserve. Instead, God says that in marriage, a couple becomes one flesh. To live together, honor each other with their bodies, and serve him with their combined lives. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That's Mark 10, 9. Bottom line, you're not your own. When challenged about the lawlessness of divorce, Jesus cited Genesis, stating clearly that the human act of joining together in marriage is at the same time God's work. We leave our parents and cleave to our spouses, a human act encouraged by our sexual instincts and shaped by the historical institution of marriage, and God joins us together. Because God's grace is at work in marriage, Jesus teaches us that our marital unions are capable of lifelong fidelity, signified by the prophet's use of marriage as an image of God's enduring covenant with Israel. And here he says here, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's from Jeremiah 31, three. In the union created by marriage, the Lord affirms we participate in the power of God's everlasting love. Though the dissolution of marriages is treated differently in various Christian churches, we together confess that marriage was originally ordained by God to be indissoluble. Indis yeah. Indissoluble. It's not supposed to be dissolved. This is where the problem comes in at because you have 50% of the marriages in Christian marriages end in, end in divorce. Um, we just don't want to, we don't want to have anybody telling us what to do we don't want to subject ourselves to somebody telling us what to do it's the only way i can think of you know like this is my body this is my hair i'm not about to tell you how i'm about to do my hair i'm not about to tell you asking your permission as to if i want to get a tattoo or if i want to go and buy this or whatever that's why we need to go back to the original design of marriage everyone's marriage is different Whatever you and your husband decide to do or you and your wife decide to do, that's between you and him. I'm just here, you know, giving you the word. And what God is saying is that you're one flesh. And what does one mean? That you're just one. So when you're one, you can't do something and it not affects the other. It's like one body. So if I cut off my arm, my body is going to hurt. So I can't just cut off my arm and then thinking it's not going to affect the rest of my body. I can't use my left hand. Now I'm going to just use my right hand. God forbid if it's my right hand because I'm right-handed. So now I have to learn. It just affects, you guys get what I'm saying. It affects every aspect of my life because we're all one body. And that's the same significance as far as, as the church. We're all supposed to be one body. That's why it's so important to have the hand needs the eye, the eye needs the foot, the foot needs the mouth, the mouth needs the eyeball, the nose. The eye. You know, 
if you cut off your eye, lower your sense of seeing, seeing big. You can't you just walk around one eye. Or if your hearing goes, or if your taste buds goes, everything, the body is so important. It all works together. If one part goes, then it kind of goes away. It's the same thing as a marriage. You're supposed to be one. That's why it's important for you to be a whole person. And a lot of us are not, including myself. It's like a lot of things that I'm still working on, um, still trying to heal from. And um, my biggest thing is trust, you know, especially if you're a person that's been lied to a lot. And then you don't trust your own judgment and you don't trust yourself. It's like, okay, why can't we just be honest? And I get it where people, because they want to be with you, then they just, I still never understood that when it comes to the men. I get that they want to have sex, but why would you marry somebody lying? You know what I'm saying? And that's the same thing with women going into these relationships and you're not honest. Where do you expect for it to go? What do you think is going to happen? I just never understood that mentality. So we, need to do the work on ourselves. And I think the biggest thing with me, because I am a very independent person, is this oneness and understanding what God really meant with the um, with oneness and just saying, okay, Lord, how is this going to work? So um, I'm sorry, guys, my light is horrible in here. So you can barely see me. Let's see if I can move back into you. Okay, it's a little bit better now. So um, we're once we understand um, God's um, purpose in our lives, and then we know that we're not our own, right? So we just do, we're supposed to do the work on ourselves. So when we marry, then we're united with our spouses, and we're as one, and then, you know, it, it should work. It's, it should work. But that's only if we've done the work on ourselves, right? That's only if we've done the work on ourselves. So that's my lesson, guys. It's kind of like a um, uh, kind of a fast lesson since we're a little bit late tonight. But of course, if you have any questions, definitely inbox me. But the prayer for the week is God help me to see my spouse as you see them. Help me to put aside all backbiting and bitterness and strife for a covenant wrapped in your love. Please, God, help me to live before my spouse in a way that pleases you. I made my vows to you, O oh Lord, and no matter what they do, my vow to honor is made to help you, is, is made um, to you. So the bottom line is your vows to God. Help me to honor my spouse during those times that my flesh doesn't want to. I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. So bottom line, you're going to pray Father, for, for the Father to make you more um, united with your spouse if you're married. And if you're not married, the prayer will be for your future spouse. You want to be healed. You want to be whole. You want to be... Um, in a position to where you're healthy to be a, a to be a, a married. Something to think about. Once you say I do, God sees you and your spouse is one. So just kind of keep that in mind that you guys are one with everything, with your credit scores, with his children. If he has kids before you come, all of y'all, you guys are a unit. You are a family, a blended families. But at the end of the day, God sees all that as one. He don't see that as no blended nothing. That is one unit. Your assignment for the week, praying for your spouse challenge. Each day at the top of the hour for 12 hours, pray for your spouse. So let's say you get up in the morning at six o'clock or whenever you get up, pray six o'clock, seven o'clock. Just if, if, there's no, if there's no issues, you just pray, Lord, just keep my husband today, keep my wife today, Lord, that she grows closer to you, um, Lord, that she wants more of you, whatever God puts on your heart. So just do that for 12 straight hours. That you're, you're waking. Hopefully, you're up 12 hours straight. So just pray on the hour, every hour, seven days for your spouse. Ask God to show you specifically what to pray for. Write down your prayers. Write down the testimonies from those prayers. So when you're praying, because you may generic but then as you're praying god is going to start revealing stuff to you and some stuff you're going to already know because that's your spouse but if you have one of those spouses that's perfect and that you're so in love with you know you may not so you're like okay lord i have no clue what to pray for but god will show you so just jot all of that down and then you'll then have a journal to go and pray and then you'll see the testimonies right even if it's a year from now you'll be able to go back and look at this journal that's the whole point of this book is when you go back next year 2020 and look through the journal you'll be able to see all of the answered prayers that's the whole point of it just to see how amazing god is 
that's my lesson tonight. So next week, oh, I'm so excited. I love teaching these lessons, guys. So um, we talked about the two shall become one. Um, uh oh, I think I think you got his divorce. Okay, here we go. So next week's lesson is that, 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 that drum roll do not deprive each other that's coming from first corinthians 7 5 so i just let your little imagination roll with that one do not deprive each other okay everybody uh until next week see ya